Good evening. I want to welcome everyone to our Wisdom Night Bible study. Um, last week we uh, talked about being girding up our loins of our mind, uh, and we talked about walking in holiness. This week I want to focus on how, the how to. Um, and so um, it's important for us to realize that God not has not only declared to us what we should do, but he's also told us how. Um, that we can do this. Verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be uh, brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, so not only is, is he telling us what we must do, but today I want to focus, how, how do I get to that place? Because there's so many times I found myself saying, well, I know what you said I need to do, but but how do I get there? How do I get to the place where the spirit man is stronger than the flesh? How do I get to the place when temptations here, I'm so caught up in that moment and in that temptation that sometimes I find it hard to, to concentrate or focus on who I need to be. And sometimes that's a lack of the knowledge of the word of God because we didn't read the Bible like we ought to have or we hadn't been in the scriptures as we used to be. And therefore we find ourselves in a momentary weakness, not having ourselves understood what the word says concerning us. And so the first thing I wanna say uh, is how do we do this? Well, let's first define what it means to be to gird up the lungs of your mind. This means to gather up all loose thoughts as the uh, Romans uh, or as the children of God would take their loose garment and roll it into their belt and tighten it down. Uh, they tightened their, uh, their attire. Same thing here. You're gathering your loose thoughts. To gird up your mind and thoughts means to concentrate or focus your attention upon the coming salvation. Uh, I cannot be f focusing on the trouble at hand. Sometimes if I'm not careful, I'll be so busy looking at the wind and the waves and the storms that I forget that God is still the commander. My God, he's still the one who commands and the winds and the seas have to obey Boy, that ought to make you shout right there. But so we can be like Simon Peter who had our, has eyes on Jesus. And when he has eyes on Jesus, he was able to, to walk on the water. But the moment he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink in the waves and in the, in the wind. So the very thing that he focused on is the very thing that had power over his life. When he focused on Jesus, Jesus had power over his life and he was able to do the impossible. But when he focused on the winds and the waves, then those things had power on him. So gather up all your thoughts. To gird up your mind means to concentrate or focus upon God's ability to save you. Don't focus on the trouble, focus on God's ability to save you. Somebody ought to say praise God on that thought. Man, that's an awesome thought. For every trial, God will send the grace that we need in the moment that we need it. And the word tells us that he is to able to give us all things. I love that word. All things that we may have all sufficiency in all things. And I praise the Lord for that. During Peter's day, men wore those robes and they would tie that belt uh, around their waist. And when they were set upon some strange actions, they would gather up their robe and tighten it under the belt so that the robe would not flip around and hinder their work. As a believer, we are to gather up the loins of our mind, gather up all the loose thoughts and focus and concentrate upon the grace and salvation of God. He is to to strain, to control every thought. There are times when you're in the middle of the battle, it's hard not to look at the wind. It's hard not to look at the waves. I mean, especially when it's being thrown in your face and you're constantly being bombarded by the attacks of the devil or by different various things that are attacking you in this world. But the reality is, is if, we're, if we focus on that, 
well, then we're going to continue to think we're defeated. We're going to think that it has more power than we have. And we're going to think that it, that it's going to subdue us. But when our mind focuses on God, think about it like this. God's never lost a battle. Wow. <laughs> God's never lost a war. God's never lost at anything that he's ever done. Can you say praise God for that? So, so if, if there's a battle in my life and I'm a son or a daughter of God, then God will give me the victory and he's not gonna allow me to, to be destroyed. Now listen, so what I do, I focus on whatsoever things are true. The truth is God is still God, even in the midst of this coronavirus season. Is God still God? Absolutely. I am persuaded, as Paul said. I am convinced. What does he mean by that? There are events in my life in the past that has convinced me that no matter where I was, God was true. So the first thing we need to understand that God is, wow, God is, and here's another thing. The scripture tells us that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. So that's one of the things. What are, what are, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and listen, and whatsoever things are of good report, Listen, in our life, there are times when, when, when we know the truth that God is God, but we don't know what God's plan may be in that particular moment. And sometimes we look at life, maybe, maybe it's, we're looking at life through the lens of the news that we just got. I mean, I've got dear friends of mine, dear friends that have gotten a message that they uh, have gotten cancer. I, I can't imagine living uh, in their shoes uh, and having to to hear that doctor say that and all the baggage that comes with that. Oh uh, man, what does that mean about tomorrow? Surgeries and appointments and oh, am I going to have to have chemotherapy? Am I going to have to have radiation? All these uncertainties. But all in all, the bottom line rests in this. God is the one who created me. I am fashioned by God. Oh, hallelujah. He said that I was fearfully and wonderfully made by him. He said before I ever lived one day, he fashioned all of my days. So the certainty that I do know is that God has ordered my steps and I am his child. So, well, what about the doctors? What, what, I, what he says? I say this also knowing that I'm not walking in their shoes and I don't pretend one moment to, to be able to understand. But this is what I do know. I do know that no matter what the doctor said, God is the final say in my life. He's the author so what are you saying? I'm saying that whatever God has penned will be. And if God says I'm going to live, then I'm going to live and declare the glories of the Lord. And if God said it's time for me to go home, then I'm going to go home and receive my eternal reward. Either way, I win. Either way, I am going to walk in what God has ordered for me. And so, uh, so even if I receive a bad report, I've got a good report. My soul will be redeemed. My, my, my earthly body may perish, but my spirit man shall always dwell in the presence of the Lord. So the Bible says, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Note how clearly and, and simply scripture states this. We're not to allow our thoughts to roam about and harbor thoughts of lust or worldliness. Sometimes when we are contemplating what we may be gaining or losing by the battles that we're facing, 
we're contemplating about some earthly or worldly things we may lose. For instance, we may wonder in the midst of this coronavirus, if you're laid off and you don't have a job and you're not getting a steady paycheck, you may say, well, I'm going to lose my house or I can lose my car or I can lose these. But here's what I want you to understand. I'm not saying that that can't happen or won't happen. It may very well happen. But here's what I want you to understand. There is something greater than that. What is, what is that? Because God will cause goodness and mercy to follow me all the days of my life. And, and, and with that, I can understand that if I lose my house, God will give me another. If I lose my car, then God will provide another. God has a way to make even what was intended to break us, intended to harm us, God said, I'll turn it around, come on, for your good. What the devil meant for harm, God said, I'll take that and turn it around for your good. I remember several years ago, I I just knew God had called us uh, in a ministry and the, God, the avenue by which we were going to take was to, to leave a certain job and go to another. I, I'm not saying whether God did or do not set that up. I don't know. Um, I think some of the decisions were made by flesh and not by God. I just have to admit that, amen. Don't like to admit that, but that's the truth. Uh, and in that, I found that uh, it was a difficult road. Uh, and in the in the winter of 96, I remember going from making good money, solid money, to making very poor money. We didn't even average during that time. Uh, I didn't average $100 a week in pay, and, and Pam was only making $200 a week in pay. And there was some, uh, the month of December of 96, I didn't draw a paycheck at all, even though I worked, oh man, I worked 14, 15 hours a day, uh, every day, except for on Sundays. And, 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 and in all that time, I'm like, how am I going to make it? I, I mean, it hurt me financially. It hurt me. It hurt my credit. It hurt all manner of parts of my life. But in the end, now this is what's so powerful. God provided a way for me to pay every bill. All of my bills got paid. I never lacked food at any time. Now, there was time the cupboards got empty. Now, I, I mean, I remember one day it was so empty there wasn't, there wasn't a can uh, of green beans in, or a can of corn in the, in the cupboard. But God provided. We never missed a meal. I want you to understand that. God provided for a way for us. And, uh, and in the midst of all of that, in the end, God caused us to be in a better position than we were when we entered that storm. So what, what are you saying? I'm saying when we entered into the battle, we entered with the weight of all that financial stress and the uncertainty of whether we was going to be able to pay our bills the way we needed to. We, rem we was reminded of the Lord to be faithful in our tithing. And when we did that, God provided a way God made a way where there was no way. And at the end of that difficult season, that season was two years long. <coughs> Pardon me. That season was two years long. But at the end of that two-year season, we came out better than we started. I apologize. I got a little itchy throat there. Now, we're not to allow the thoughts <coughs> of this world or thoughts of around us or thoughts of our circumstances to control our focus and where we're looking. We are to focus our thoughts upon the things of virtue and of praise. Well, what's a virtue? The fact that God has made today. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, we can't just rejoice on sunny days. We need to rejoice on rainy days. There's a purpose for the rain. Yeah. Without rain, there's no growth. Come on now. Without battles, there's no strength that's drawn from those battles. So we need to praise God when it's peacetime, and we need to praise God in the battles. We need to praise God when things are going our way, and we need to praise God when things don't go our way. Listen, one of the most powerful prayers that you can give God is to praise God for the prayers he did not answer 
My, my, my. There are things that we ask for that would have been harmful to our future and the destiny that God's plan for our life because we saw one way and God had another plan, another way. And our way would have contrasted against God's way. And so God said, no, I'm not answering your prayer. I'm answering my will for your life. <clears throat> and I want to just say this. And again, I apologize. In Joshua chapter 5, one of the things, I believe it's from verse 13, one of the things that, that, um, that Joshua asked the, the, the angel of the Lord and the man that he saw, he said, are you for us or are you for our adversary? I love the answer that this, this, uh, the angel of the Lord, which we believe to be a Christ at that time, uh, uh, to be. Um, he says, neither. Wow. I'm not here for you. I'm not here for your adversary. He said, but I'm the commander of the Lord's army. I'm here to bid for my Lord. I'm here to do his work. Sometimes God is doing things in your life that's not what you want, and you need to have confidence in this, that God knows what he's doing, and trust God, he knows how to bring you to a better place. Now, we need to praise God when it's good and when it's bad. We are not to allow thoughts to tear down our moral or godly fiber. Uh, scripture is even more clear and forceful in another passage. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. There's too many Christians that are battling battles or fighting battles through the flesh, and we wonder why we're losing. If you're fighting in the flesh, you will you will reap uh, uh, corruption. That's what the scripture says. Now listen to what he says here. We do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God. I love this. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen, if the stronghold, if you're fighting against a stronghold and it's not falling, you might be fighting with the wrong thing. You might be fighting out of the flesh and not out of the spirit. Come on, somebody help me out. But the Bible tells me that if I fight God's battle, God's way with God's weaponry, he says that, that the power we have through God is mighty and its purpose is to pull down the strongholds. And he listen to what he says here, casting down imaginations. My, my, my. Most of the battles that we fight, it's right here. Amen? Come on, somebody tell me. Say, preach it, pastor. Tell the truth. Amen? I'm telling you, most of the battles we battle, how many times has the devil jumped in our head, gotten in our head through some thought, through some outside resource, through somebody who thought they were trying to help us out, but told us things that we did not need to hear, and it caused us to think about things in ways we shouldn't. Maybe somebody come and said, brother, so-and-so said such and such about you, and all of a sudden, your flesh starts fighting and starts battling here. Listen, he he said, cast down those imaginations. Oftentimes when we don't know for certain what was said and what was not, we often assume the worst. Many times there was much more assumptions to things that were never there. Now listen, he said, and every high thing that exalts itself, now here, this is powerful, against the knowledge of God. In other words, if something that's being said to you produces something contrary to the knowledge of God, it's not from God. For instance, if somebody comes to you and says, brother so-and-so said such and such, okay, your immediate response is to believe it even though you haven't factually found out whether it was true or not. It could be that brother so-and-so did not say those things at all. It could be that it might have been said, the words may be right, but the wrong context in which it was stated. So that it was said out of one thing with one purpose, and yet it was delivered in a different manner. Don't tell me the devil don't play with your mind, amen? The thing is, anything, it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So if something causes you to want to retaliate, come on, so somebody said something, oh, brother said, and you, your first response is, oh, I'm going to set them straight. You just wait the next time I see them. That's automatically positioned you against the knowledge of God. What's the knowledge of God say? The knowledge of God says forgive. 
Oh, and it shall be forgiven you. That's the trap of the devil. He's put something that's played with your mind and all of a sudden you've got harbored ill feelings of something that you don't even know that's factual. Come on. And now it's caused you to position yourself against the knowledge of God. There are so many Christians today. Now you need to hear me when I fix a say. There are so many Christians today that harbor unforgiveness and that is ungodly and that is not pleasing to God. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you won't forgive your brother, neither will I forgive you your debts. Wow. So if I'm harboring ill feelings and I'm harboring, uh, if, if some, and here's how I know I'm harboring ill feelings. If somebody's name is being said and I've got an ill feeling towards them, man, you can tell it on my face. You can tell it on yours. Come on, some of y'all couldn't hide the way you feel about nothing. You turn around, somebody says their name and automatically that face goes, you start drawing up and pruning up like a like an old nasty prune. Come on. Uh, I should say nasty prune. Some people like them things. But anyway, your lips all pruned up and your, your heart's all bitter because you allow something that you ain't even validated to be in your heart. And now you're having ill feelings towards your brother and you're harboring unforgiveness. It is a trap of Satan to cause you to be ineffective in your walk with God because devil knows the moment that you have ill feelings towards brother so-and-so then you no longer can stand before God and say, God, forgive me, because he knows that God's not going to forgive you until you forgive brother so-and-so. Now listen, anything is to tear down anything, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If there's anything that produces in you a feeling that's contrary to the fruits of the Spirit, you need to cast them out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, if it, gives, if it causes fear, that's not of God. Come on now. I'm not talking about fear as reverence. I'm talking about fear as in scared, okay? Apprehensions. What I'm talking about, and, and love. Love is ought to be the fruit of our heart. But if we don't demonstrate love, the Bible says love casts out fear. So, so I want you to understand this. If it exalts itself by the knowledge of God, Get rid of it. He said, don't, don't let those things preoccupy you. You fight the battle in the spirit and you cast down those imaginations. The Bible says, listen, I love this. And to bring into captivity every thought. Woo! Man, that, that, what it tells me, there are gonna be thoughts that come into our mind. And God says, I'm not going to be ignorant of the fact that you're gonna have thoughts come to your mind. He said, I'm telling you to hold those thoughts that are contrary to me, contrary to my word, contrary to my character, contrary to my nature, contrary to my love, that I want you to bring them into captivity. Every thought. He said, I want you to bring them into obedience to Christ. Somebody slap you in the face, you feel justified, slap them back. But that's not the way God is. Jesus said, turn your cheek. Turn the other cheek. Man, that's a hard thing to do, especially when somebody strikes you or somebody offends you. But maybe they didn't strike your face. Maybe they struck your ego by turning around saying something that, that attacked you as a person. And they may have said that you wasn't a person of integrity, and all of a sudden now you're angry and mad with them. Listen, bring that thought into captivity. It doesn't matter if they said it or not. Don't let somebody's thoughts or what they said bring you into captivity. Come on now. We don't need to allow what other people do can't hold us captive. We need to bring those thoughts, every thought, into captivity. What, to what? To the obedience of Christ. Now, the very warfare of the believer is spiritual and mental. Now, you need to get that. The very warfare that we fight is spiritual and mental. Therefore, the believer must cast down those imaginations, must cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and then also then bring it into captivity, every thought to obedience of Christ. Imagine every thought is to be captive in Christ or for Christ. Believers are to gird up their loins of their minds, gather up all their thoughts of their minds and focus upon the grace of God and the salvation of God. I'm just going to give you some support of scripture here, and we're going to end with these few thoughts here. The Bible says in Romans 8, verses 5 and 6, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, what are you after? I'm after the Spirit. I'm not after the flesh. I'm after the Spirit. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. 
For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why is it so important for me to gather my thoughts? Because if I allow myself to continue to be carnally minded, it's going to lead me to death. That's the ultimate thing. The devil doesn't care how he gets you there. He just wants you to die. He wants your spirit man to die. He wants your will and your desire to serve God to die. And if you follow the flesh, that's where you're going to be. You're going to end up dying inside. But if you are focused on the spirit and you hold those things captive, he's listen, the spirit minded one is of life and peace. Wow. Wow. Life and peace. He says, um, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Wow, what a powerful word. It's up to you. It's up to me. It's up to us as the children of God to realize that we must present ourselves unto God. We got to quit worrying about what man thinks. We need to worry about what God thinks. And as long as you're approved of God, who cares what a man thinks about you? Sometimes you can do the best you can do and you'll never win anybody over. But if you will stand before God and you will make it your heart's contention to be have your mind girded up to be an obedient to him, God will be pleased with you. And that's all that matters. Now, listen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verse 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Wow. That he may instruct him. Woo, hallelujah. But we have the mind of Christ. Now listen, we have the mind of Christ in us. What is that mind? That mind that is directed by the nature and the characteristics of Christ. We can find that through the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, happiness. Come on. Uh, Self-control. Come on. We can go through all the nine fruits of the Spirit and talk about what we should be. That is the character of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that that ought to be who we are because we have the mind of God. Uh, and then in this, 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 this Ephesians 4 and 23, it says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man, which is after God and is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wow, what a great word. What a great word. And then we have Colossians 3, verse 10, it says, and having put on a new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Wow. Now, I love this, and I'm gonna end with this last thought. The Bible says that will keep him, per him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. I, I pray that something I said tonight will encourage you. I pray that you will gird up every bit of the thoughts in your mind and let your mind be focused on the Lord. And I pray that God will challenge you to be obedient to him in all ways so that you can walk in the perfect peace and love and in the holiness of Almighty God. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this study that you've allowed us to understand that not only have you told us to, but now we find through scripture, you've told us how, how we can gird up our minds, how we can gather our thoughts and put our focus upon you, realizing that you are able to keep in perfect peace those whose mind has stayed upon thee. For I pray, Father, that you will touch each and every heart that's, being, that's battling, whatever storm they're battling throughout this season. I pray that you'll give them strength upon strength and allow the power of the Holy Ghost to give them the power to overcome. We honor you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. This is my worship. This is my offering. In every moment, I withhold nothing. I'm learning to trust you, even when I can't see it. And even in suffering, I have to believe it. If you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. I'm letting go If you're in it with me I'll begin And when you say to jump I'm diving in If you say
be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. It felt like a burden, but once I could cry.